Welcome to Get Sleepy, where we listen, we relax, and we get sleepy. My name's Tom, and I'm your host. Thanks for tuning in. Tonight, TK will be reading a sleepy retelling of the classic fairy tale, The White Slipper. If you're familiar with another version, this one is a little different. We'll travel to a beautiful, faraway city on a river, where a king has a problem that almost nobody can solve. In the end, we'll find that a little bit of reading and a lot of courage can make all the difference. So, let's settle in and prepare for a great night's rest. Snuggle up in your covers, finding a comfy position, and take some deep, nourishing breaths just to help you relax. As you breathe, Pay attention to your body. Are there any areas that feel tense or restless? If so, just spend a moment tuning into that area. And as you release each breath, allow a greater sense of relaxation to clear out the tension more and more. You can do this for as much time as you'd like, noticing any discomfort and just spending a moment acknowledging those sensations, then letting them gradually fade with each calming release. As you continue to relax, let TK's voice guide you into a night of deep sleep. May a sense of imagination be your gateway. Visualize a shining waterway spanned by beautiful arched bridges. On either side, there is a bustling city filled with twisting streets. This is where our story begins. Many years ago, there was a charming city on the banks of a wide and lazy river. It was the greatest city in the kingdom. This was because the royal family lived there in a beautiful palace. The river also created a natural hub for commerce. The port sent and received goods up and down the river. And these goods traveled as far as the towns near the ocean and beyond. Because of its excellent reputation for trade and its position on a major waterway. The town was prosperous and lively. Merchants of all types flourished. 
building stately homes on either side. Gracious bridges appeared to sail weightlessly over the water, joining the people on the left to the people on the right. Even the humbler craftsmen benefited from the robust life of the city, finding plenty of horses to shoe, tools to make, and potions to mix. As the saying goes, a rising tide lifts all boats. And that was the case for the fortunate citizens of this part of the kingdom. The king was a good-natured and festive sort of person. In fact, some might have called him a little frivolous. His daughter was the Princess Kira. She was greatly admired. Suitors from all the nearby kingdoms visited with lavish gifts, hoping to win her hand. The throne room became piled high with jewels, fine silk, clever mechanical music boxes, and exotic teas and spices. Each visitor tried to outdo the last with his offering of love. However, these suitors were challenged by more than just competition with each other. It happened that, in addition to shining beauty and wealth, the princess was also blessed by an abundance of intelligence. Because of that, she was not in a hurry to marry. As the only heir to the throne, she had spent her life studying what she liked. She had read many classic texts and studied languages, history, and music. The princess had high standards for those who would seek to be her husband. And none of her suitors could seem to keep up with her in conversation. One after the other, they were rejected. As for the king, he wasn't in a hurry for her to be wed. And he was often too busy enjoying his life and taking part in the entertainments of the court to bother protesting. The king had a magnificent white horse, and one of his favorite pastimes was to go out for long rides. One day, while he was enjoying a canter through the woods, his horse was spooked by a wily fox. The faithful mount reared up, and the king was thrown from the saddle. Although he mostly fared all right, he caught his foot in the stirrup. The king rested for many days, and many court healers applied poultices, but his foot never quite felt the same. 
walking on it just wasn't comfortable anymore. It made him sad to think he might not be able to enjoy life as he had before. Some time later, the princess received a suitor who had brought her a truly wondrous gift. It was a pair of baby soft silk slippers in the most delicate pink. The suitor told her that these slippers would allow her to dance all day and night without ever feeling any pain from tired feet. Kira was skeptical about this claim. In the spirit of science, however, she tried the slippers at a lavish ball a city merchant was hosting the next night. She found, to her amazement, that the promise was true. She danced constantly at the glittering party all night and then all the next day, until she was simply too tired to continue. Somehow, her feet were as comfortable at the last dance as they had been at the first. Curious about where the shoes had come from, she asked the suitor how he'd obtained them. He told her that he had paid a great price to a famous traveling shoemaker who had passed through his kingdom. Kira had an idea. What if a shoe could be made to fit her father? If the same medical wizardry might be applied to the king's foot, she hoped that perhaps he could walk happily again. She sent one of the king's most loyal and speediest servants to find the elusive shoemaker. Promising the craftsman a lavish payment if he could bring her a miraculous cure. The weeks dragged on, and Kira's father continued to lie in bed. When the king wasn't happy, the city wasn't happy. All festivities ground to a halt. Without their king to plan all the celebrations they were used to, the entire town found that life was much less exciting. Finally, one day, the long-awaited servant returned with the famous shoemaker. The court was a flutter with excitement. They'd heard their guest already had a shoe with him that he claimed would cure the king of his discomfort. He was to present it in the throne room the very next day. Naturally, the shoemaker was given the finest guest room at the palace for the night. He grandly took up residence in his chamber, ordering the footman to place a very special, richly carved wooden chest at the foot of his bed. <laughs> 
all eyes were on that chest. Because everyone knew it must hold the magical shoe for the king. One of the servants in the palace was a young man named Rowan. His job was to clean the fireplaces and tidy up in all the rooms. Rowan was a very handsome and intelligent fellow. He had been raised by his uncle, who was the owner of a bookshop. Because of that, he'd read a great deal over the years, but he had no money. Getting a job at the palace had seemed like his best chance at making ends meet. So he cleaned all day, every day, without complaint. Rowan came to the famous shoemaker's chamber once the man had gone down to dinner. He built up the fire and looked to see if anything in the room needed straightening. His eye fell on the intricately carved wooden box. Like everyone else, he knew it had to hold something special. And he couldn't stop himself from taking a little peek. Running his hands over the beautiful carving, he decided he'd just look inside quickly. He pulled open the heavy metal latch and peered in. There, resting on purple velvet, was a large white silk slipper. He didn't dare touch it for fear he might smudge it with ashes. He had never seen a shoe so fine. As he was admiring it, he heard a noise in the hall. He realized the shoemaker must be returning. Rowan closed the lid of the box and slid himself under the bed, where he could hide behind the dust ruffle. The shoemaker entered the room, and Rowan could hear the sound of some items being set out on the table. Laying his head flat to the ground, he could just see the man placing some sort of jar and a soft brush there. The man then approached the wooden chest, which made Rowan nervous, since it was so near the bed. But he didn't notice Rowan at all. Instead, he took the beautiful white slipper from the chest. Carrying it back to the table, he proceeded to lightly brush the inside of the slipper with some sort of powder from the jar. It glittered briefly in the firelight. Then he tapped the brush three times on the jar, resealed it, and put all the materials and the shoe away. Having completed this task and humming cheerfully to himself, he fetched the velvet cloak and once again left the chamber. <laughs> 
When he was sure the shoemaker was gone, Rowan crawled out from under the bed. There was nothing on the table now, and the chest was firmly closed. Not wanting to be caught snooping, Rowan left the room and continued with his chores. But as he cleaned, he couldn't get the shoe out of his mind. He wondered what the man had been doing with the glittering powder. Rowan wasn't in the throne room the next day for the grand occasion, but he heard that the shoe was a success. According to the servant's gossip, the king's pain had vanished when the shoe was placed on his foot, and he was already back to being his old self. Apparently, the king was already out on a walk around the garden with some of the nobles of the court, and a lavish ball was being planned. The shoemaker had been richly rewarded in gold and was departing to fulfill other requests in distant kingdoms. The entire city rejoiced, knowing life would return to normal. The king threw himself back into life with enthusiasm and he was soon spending his time planning a grand regatta on the river for all the citizens to attend. The day of the regatta was declared a holiday, and there were to be many games and races, and, of course, feasting. The king had a barge prepared where he would have his court assembled on the river to watch the boat races. It was large enough for dancing. There was much talk about who would have the privilege of sitting there during the event. The holiday brought sparkling sunshine, and the river was full of little boats flying colorful flags. The clear water of the river glittered as though it was full of jewels. The entire city was filled with music and the smell of delicious food. The king and his court made merry on the barge, dancing and eating and laughing throughout the day. But then something unexpected happened. As the king was leaning over to speak to someone in a different boat, he lost his balance and almost fell over the edge of the barge. Luckily, there were many people nearby to help him. But by the time he was safely standing again, he had lost his beloved white slipper. It landed in the river, bobbed briefly at the surface, and then sank. A cry went up that everyone who could swim should go in after the shoe. 
People in nearby boats hung over the sides, running their hands through the water. Many dived right into the river and swam about looking for it. But in the end, the slipper could not be found. Almost at once, the king began to say that he was uncomfortable and couldn't walk on his foot. He was carried home, inconsolable. Over the next few days, the river was teeming with activity. The king promised a handsome reward to anyone who could find his shoe. Before long, word had spread to nearby kingdoms, and fortune hunters arrived, determined to capture the prize for themselves. They searched and searched for the shoe, but had no luck in finding it. They walked the same beaches, sifted through the same mud, and hung nets from boats in the same channels. Kira watched as each of them failed time and time again. She watched as her father grew more and more hopeless every day. One morning, she made up her mind. She announced that in addition to the reward from her father, she would marry whoever could succeed in completing this most daunting task. Now, unlike her father, Kira didn't think the shoe would ever be found in the river. It was deep and had swallowed up much more than shoes in the past. But she secretly hoped that someone with a little more creativity, someone she could love and respect, might come through with an even better idea to cure her father's ailment. Like every other person in the kingdom, Rowan heard Kira's announcement. Although he was merely a servant, he was completely smitten by the princess. He found her dazzling. It was because of her wit, as well as her beauty. Rowan remembered that his uncle had a shelf of science and alchemy books in his bookshop. He had pored over those books as a youth, marveling at the mysteries they reveal. He knew nothing about magic shoes, but he had not forgotten how the shoemaker had secretly dusted the king's slipper with some type of powder. And it only made sense that the powder was responsible for the pain relief. Rowan decided to search for the source of the powdered treatment rather than wasting time finding the shoe itself. He was tireless in his pursuit. While the river was teeming with fortune hunters, diving and combing the banks, Rowan spent his free time in his uncle's bookshop. <laughs> 
It was a wonderful place, piled high with tomes of all kinds. There were cookbooks and worn volumes about history. There were classic texts in all different languages. Novels and storybooks were stacked haphazardly along with poetry. Here and there, one could find a cozy, worn armchair in a little corner and get lost in a good book for hours. Rowan spent every possible moment in the nooks and crannies of his uncle's little shop. When he couldn't stay, he borrowed books on alchemy and brought them back with him to the palace to read in his spare time. One day, he found his answer. Buried in a dusty book about herbalism, there was mention of a plant that grew in a special place on the plains of a nearby kingdom. Its pollen was known to cure pain, but it had to be harvested in the moonlight and could not be diluted or dissolved in liquid or turned into a syrup. It had to be used in its powdery form. According to the maps Rowan was able to find, it would take him about a week of travel to reach this place on horseback. Now, he didn't have a horse, nor did his uncle. Anyone he knew who might be fortunate enough to own one surely couldn't part with it for weeks. Rowan knew that getting to this miraculous plant was his only hope to solve the king's problem. And maybe, just maybe, win Kira's hand. Risking everything, he decided to speak to the king at the next public audience in the throne room. Later that week, he lined up with all of the citizens who waited outside the king's chambers to make their requests. The public audience was always a lengthy and trying affair, and the king tended to get grumpy as the day went on. Sadly for Rowan, he was nearly last in line. After many hours, and with only a handful of people left in the room, Rowan stood before the king. He waved his hand and indicated that Rowan should speak quickly. Your Highness, he said, I think I may have discovered a way to cure your ailment. But I will need to borrow a horse. The courtiers dropped their jaws at this display of impudence. The idea of a servant boy asking the king for a horse, let alone suggesting he could cure his ailment, was ridiculous. Seeing he had only moments to make his case, Rowan continued. There is a flower that grows in a special place, he said. I know where this place is. 
but it would take me a month to get there on foot. If only you could loan me a horse, I could be back here in two weeks to relieve your pain. The nobles murmur and laugh. The king shifted in his seat and Rowan prepared to be turned away. But the young man was surprised. To the amazement of all present, the king said, Give this boy a horse and get him gone. If he can succeed where all of you have failed, it will be worth it. Then, with a dramatic wave of his hand, he dismissed Rowan and told everyone else in the room they should leave as well. Princess Kira was seated nearby during this extraordinary conversation, and she was intrigued. The fact that this young man had the sense to take a new approach made her respect him instantly. She liked clever people, and his bravery in appearing before the king with such a bold request was admirable. Although she didn't want to get her hopes up, the princess secretly wished that Rowan might pull off a miracle cure. Meanwhile, Rowan made haste to prepare for his departure. News of his audience in the throne room spread quickly, and every servant in the castle was soon whispering about it. All the other servants rallied around him as he readied himself for the journey. The cook packed him a generous supply of provisions, and the grooms offered him one of the best horses. All eyes were now on Rowan. He set off on his journey the next day, carrying his food and water, the herbalist book, and a map from his uncle. The older man had great faith in his nephew and hoped that Rowan's studies and bravery would help him find a cure. It wasn't long before Rowan had traveled farther beyond the limits of the city than he had ever been before. First, he passed over the peaceful river, then through the thick forest. Eventually, he traveled through a windy mountain pass to the grassy plains beyond. Rowan rode long hours, stopping only to rest. When he finally saw vast expanses of waving wildflowers before him, he knew he had reached his destination. Taking the precious herbalist book from his saddlebag, he left his horse to graze and began slowly circling the area with the illustration of the plant in his hand. It took him the better part of the day to find it. As the sun was setting, 
he came upon a large cluster of white flowers that matched the description in the book. He knew he had found his treasure. Taking some food from his provisions, he sat down in the grass and happily ate some dinner, waiting for night to fall. According to the book, after dark was when the flowers would open and reveal their precious gift. He drifted off to sleep while the red and orange flames of sunset lit the sky. The hooting of a night owl woke him some time later. He sat up in the cool darkness and rubbed his eyes. There Clearly visible in the moonlight was a sea of open blooms. Taking his jar, as the book instructed, he lightly tapped each of the open flowers and gently shook their glittering pollen into the container. He repeated this task patiently, moving from one bunch of flowers to another until the jar was entirely full. Then he carefully put the cap on and secured it in his saddlebag. As the sun was rising, Rowan was already making haste back home. But a question still played on his mind. What if the powder didn't work? He knew that everything was riding on his faith in this cure. Back through the windy mountain pass he rode and through the thick forest, In about a week's time, he was once again approaching the city he called home. He crossed the soaring bridge with excitement, but also trepidation. There was much excitement among the staff when he returned his trusty horse to the stable yard. The servants gathered around him, pressing him for news of his quest. Had he found what he was looking for? What was the journey like? Would the cure work as he'd promised? He was polite to everyone, but said he couldn't answer their questions just yet. Instead, he withdrew the precious jar from the baggage and put it carefully in his coat pocket. As the servants were dispersing, he bowed to one of the lady's maids and begged a favor of her. Would it be possible to loan me a soft brush of some type? The kind that a lady would use to apply makeup powder, he asked. The maid said that she could, and fetched a brush for Rowan while he waited in the stable yard. When he had it, he returned to his uncle's bookshop with the herbalist book, the map, and his jar of precious pollen. He would attend the public audience with the king tomorrow. By the next day, 
word had spread throughout the city of Rowan's return. The bold young man, who had never attracted any notice before, had suddenly become a curiosity. At the king's request, Rowan was given the very first place in line for the day. As the majestic carved double doors to the throne room swung open, he took a deep breath and stood up straighter. He tried not to allow doubt to cloud his mind. He walked toward the king who was sitting with Princess Kira at his side. The room was fuller than usual. The entire court seemed to have assembled to see Rowan. Bowing low to the king, he began. Your Majesty, I have brought what I believe will cure your pain. But it does not require a special shoe, he said. The king looked at him doubtfully. Rowan continued, drawing the jar and the brush from his coat. If you would allow me to have the shoe you are wearing now, I will demonstrate. Rowan continued. This was certainly unusual, thought the king. An ordinary person did not normally request to hold his shoe. However, the king's servant knelt and removed it when the king nodded his assent. Rowan dipped his head respectfully. Then, taking the king's silk shoe in his hand, he carefully uncapped the jar. Using the brush he'd gotten from the maid, he lightly dusted the inside of the shoe, just as he had seen the shoemaker do on the night he'd hidden under the man's bed. When the application of the pollen was complete, the moment of truth had arrived. Rowan handed the shoe back to the servant, and he gently returned it to the king's foot. Rowan stole a glance at Kira. Her eyes were wide, and she was holding her breath. The king stood. He moved his ankle and stepped. He hopped lightly. Then his face lit up with joy, and he began to dance, waving his hands merrily above his head. The entire room lit up with the chatter of a hundred nobles who had just seen the most miraculous sight they could remember. But all that Rowan cared about was what Kira thought. Shyly, he turned and looked her straight in the eye. To his relief, she smiled in return. All attention was on the king. But these two people knew that their own story together was beginning at that moment. And so it was that the king became his old self again. Finding the shoe held no magic, he ordered a lavish wardrobe of slippers in many colors. 
after all. Each one could be dusted with the same magic pollen. Many parties and festivals were planned that year, but the biggest and best one was the wedding of Kira and Rowan. The two became inseparable even before they were wed. They could often be seen strolling the gardens, engaged in lively conversation. Together, they established an extensive library at the palace, furnished by Rowan's delighted uncle. Of course, the library had many comfortable chairs and tall, rolling ladders, as well as large books of maps on broad tables. After all, Kira and Rowan felt they both still had a lot of reading to do. The king never bothered much with the library, but he was happy again, and so were all the citizens of the glittering city on the river. With Kira and Rowan, destined to inherit the crown, they knew their lives would continue to be richly blessed by merriment, prosperity, and good common sense.